Duke University. This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, Duke University religion professor Ibrahim Musa takes your questions about Islamic law. Musa is an associate professor of Islamic studies. Last year, he was named one of the 500 most influential Muslims by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center. He teaches a course called America's Gods. In 2007, Musa was invited by the King of Morocco to address an audience of scholars and political leaders on the subject of Muslim ethics. Only just means can be used in order to reach just ends. If understood in this manner, then the practice of suicide bombing is by all accounts a horrific distortion of all Islamic values. To ask Professor Musa a question, send an email to live at duke.edu, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or post to the Duke University Facebook page. Tell us what you think. Fill out the brief survey on the Duke Office Hours website. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. I'm James Todd from Duke's News Office, and I am here with Professor Ibrahim Musa, a professor in Duke's Department of Religion. We study uh, Islamic studies, and we're here to talk about Sharia law. Professor Musa, um, a word very charged in the news media. Let's start with the most basic question, what is Sharia law? Thank you, James, and thank you for having me on uh, Office Hours. Mm -hmm. um, Sharia basically means a set of model values. Uh, that Muslims have developed over the centuries. Um, it basically stems from certain interpretations of rules and regulations that have been mentioned in the Quran, and there are a few of those, and uh, a great deal of interpretation of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad that is known as the Sunnah. And then the bulk of it is basically the work and interpretation of mostly men uh, in the um, throughout Islamic uh, history, and very few women involved in this in the interpretation of the law, although that is becoming increasingly um, uh, a demand by Muslim women, and more and more Muslim women are getting engaged in the work of understanding uh, what Islamic law is. So Sharia is basically, I would say, a, a moral code. Uh, it's the set of rules and regulations, but I can also put it somewhat differently and say it's a set of sensibilities and these sensibilities are developed within particular historical contexts. So you would have, for instance, people interpreting those rules and regulations regarding marriage, divorce, inheritance, criminal law, business transactions, uh, but also a large part of what we call Sharia has got to do with Muslims' personal practice of their devotions. So how they pray, how they give their charities, how they do their fasting. The five pillars of Islam, for instance, is highly regulated by certain kind of interpretations that also falls under the rubric of Sharia. Um, and so, as I said, these are sens set of moral sensibilities, and these sensibilities go according to certain contexts, and they also uh, are, have to be <coughs> in tune with the sensibilities of, of their time. And what we have in in the discussion of Sharia today is that we have interpretations of older generations uh, and early generations of, of Islamic lawyers and doctors uh, who have given us a canon of interpretation and canonical rules and regulations. And subsequent generations have updated it in the past to make it relevant to their society. So for instance, uh, you know, there was development of Islamic law in the early dynasties of the Umayyads, then this followed by the Abbasids, and then the Ottomans, and then the, all the kind of mini dynasties that were around in India, in parts of China, in parts of Africa, parts of Muslim Spain. So these are very contextual developments. So it's very difficult to talk about a single Islamic law uh, or Sharia as something monolithic. Sharia changes according to certain times and places, but we, all, we are also stuck with some core understandings that were once very, very, uh, that fit like a glove and once very suitable to contexts that are no longer alive in our world, uh, a world 
of patriarchy, worlds of you know uh, hierarchical arrangement of societies of men at the top and uh, you know then and, and women and then slaves and slave societies and very complex understandings of of imperial uh, uh, contexts and of course how to update Islamic law to contemporary situations is possibly one of the the challenging issues. Uh, that Muslims around the world face. And, and those are some of the issues I think that I'm sure your callers and, and your people who will be contacting us would be interested in. Great. So in talking about contemporary situations, uh, those of us following the news, of course, um, uh, U.S. Senate candidate Sharon Engel uh, said that uh, Sharia had taken hold in some cities in the U.S. Uh, there's a, a referendum in Oklahoma that passed banning judges from considering Sharia law. How do you uh, observe this? What, what do you see driving this? And um, what might you correct about the way this is being portrayed in the news? Yeah. No, well, you know, this is clearly linked to the recent midterm elections, but also as the fury of the midterm elections uh, picked up speed, we know that what happened over the summer, um, the proposed plan to build a mosque a couple of blocks away from um, the uh, Manhattan site where the 9-11 tragedy took place and the outrage and anger by a number of people in New York but also it became a national issue involving the president and and all kinds of important people uh, in this country and abroad. So I think that um, that issue about you know the status of Muslims in the United States has been something that has come under the microscope and of course the media has been relaying that and also playing that story a great deal. It's also got to do, I think, with the, to a large extent, with certain kinds of contemporary political currents in our country uh, that has also been targeting the president. And because the president's middle name is Hussein, um, there has been you know, a great deal of conversation on the blogosphere and elsewhere saying that he's a closet Muslim. So that also fuels, so, if you're unhappy with the president, you also have to be unhappy against against Muslims. You have to involve and tar and, uh, and feather as many people as possible. So I would put it that Sharon Angles, for instance, criticism of Senator Reid of Nevada was in, you know, because of, you know, he's a Democrat and that, you know, they were trying to oust him. And of course, he also was then uh, persuaded uh, to not support the, the mosque in, in, uh, in New York um, or the proposed plan for it. So I think there's a, a great deal of what I would say a combination of factors of fear of immigrants, uh, concerns about domestic culture, and also I think a portion of Islamophobia that this kind of concern um, about, about that Islam is going to overrun this country. And I think this has been tragically exaggerated uh, it's part of a fear-mongering campaign, and, and it does not serve uh, the development of good neighborliness and citizenship in, in effective ways. That doesn't mean that there are not problems in the interpretation of Islamic law by Muslims living in the United States, by some court uh, officials in the U.S. and abroad. And since we live in a global society, uh, we read about these issues on a daily basis, and many of these issues are also embarrassing to Muslims living in this country and to Muslims living abroad. And unfortunately, the discussions of how Muslims are trying to address the reform of Islamic law and the reform of Sharia never really gets airtime, but only the negative uh, versions of the failure of Islamic law to deliver on its best values, uh, that obviously gets a great deal of attention. Professor Musa, we've got a number of questions that have come in, and uh, everyone who is watching this office hours is invited to ask Professor Musa a question. You can do that by Twitter, you can do it by email, you can do it by Facebook. We've got a question from Facebook. Uh, Alan asks, the U.S. Constitution is founded on the fact that the U.S. government will never, he emphasizes, allow a state-sanctioned religion. Please explain how Sharia can be compatible with our Constitution when an Islam religion and state have been interwoven for 1400 years? I think that that is not necessarily uh, a, a correct uh, impression that in Sharia religion and state have been interwoven, uh, although I think it, it, they, it did occur in, at some moments in Islamic history and other mm -hmm. moments there was also a, a different kind of relationship. So what it is is that Islamic governance has a certain kind of uh, 
a dimension of a secular authority, uh, but it's also, it's also justified and authorized through a certain kind of reference to, you know, who is the caliph representing? And so is the caliph the, uh, doing the work of God on, on earth, but does the caliph also represent the people? And who's the caliph? Who, the, the, and the caliph is the kind of uh, symbolic leader and the political authority of, of the Muslims. And that's when you had empires. So the question is that when Islam comes into a context says like, like the United States, there can be no doubt that the U.S. Constitution does not allow for any state religion. And so Islam in the United States will be a private matter. But it will also be culturally vibrant. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes culturally vibrant, so you'll have Muslims in prisons, you'll have being Muslims who have contracts among themselves involving Islamic law. These cultural and personal contracts of Muslims, all these questions are where Muslims are making demands in terms of freedom of religion and freedom of expression to express themselves in American uh, civil and public culture, these issues will be a topic of debate. In the same way that Jewish cultural and religious practices come into interview and uh, discuss Christian ones, Buddhist ones, uh, Hindu ones, we are a, a, a melting pot of diverse, uh, diverse societies. So clearly, the, this kind of uh, fear that many people have that, the sh that Muslims in the United States have one goal only and that Islam is not a religion, it's an ideology, it's a politics, that what it's going to do is going to overrun this country uh, and substitute the constitution with the Sharia. I think it's clearly the height of fear-mongering and it's not a very sane conversation because I have not seen anybody in this country make those kind of claims. Yes, there are Muslims who want to propagate their faith values and they want to talk about that, but then everybody in this country can advocate their faith values and people can accept it or reject it. Uh, but there is, at least in my view, there is no fear uh, that Islamic law can ever uh, become part of the foundation, fundamental law of the United States. In talking about rhetoric about uh, Islamic law taking over, um, th there is some uh, incident or you know grain of truth that, that sparks this um, in terms of uh, family law and arbitration, and uh, you talked about this case in New Jersey that I think is an interesting example of a, a Muslim couple, husband and wife, and the wife uh, following a, a filing for a restraining order, and then the husband arguing, uh, well, you know, culturally what was happening in our family was okay under Islamic law. Could you play that case out a little bit mm -hmm. and, and explain where we are seeing this intersection of right. Islamic culture, law, and uh, American law? Right. I think, first of all, there have been a number of cases in our courts throughout the United States in which elements of Islamic law were heard by the courts and the courts either accepted it or rejected it. Uh, accepted it when there was no clash between those contracts or understandings between parties, that Muslim parties or marriage contracts that they had or divorce uh, settlements that involve elements of Islamic law, if that did not clash with any fundamental rule or value of our legal system, then courts would enforce it because these are the contracts between parties. There were also issues, for instance, in our courts of prisoners who are Muslims making certain kind of demands and uh, filing uh, cases and suits against uh, uh, the uh, correction services. Um, there's a whole range of other kind of issues that are already prevalent, international contracts, for instance. Or you have here um, Islamic Sharia compliant finance that is exercised on, in, in Wall Street, uh, where Islamically compliant uh, stocks and shares are sold and traded according to Islamic rules and regulations. These are all very much part of our cultural and political and economic life. The case you are referring to happened this year in June in New Jersey, where a Moroccan couple who were married in 2008 had a family disputes and involved domestic violence. And part of the domestic violence was also that the wife was coerced into having sex with her husband against her wishes. So she filed for a, uh, a, a, a restraining order. But in the meanwhile, the couple had also gone through a process of having an Islamic uh, divorce uh, taken place between them. So when the matter appears in front of Judge uh, Joseph Charles, he then does not, he does recognize that there's a conflict here between New Jersey criminal statute and which had been violated and the husband's defense, 
a cultural religious defense that he is entitled to have sex with his wife under circumstances that even if the wife is not willing, and he makes that kind of defense. And the judge then airs that viewpoint. He then mulls over it, articulates it in his, ju in his judgment, but then decides that he's not going to enforce the restraining order because the parties have already separated. Of course, in the media it played out that Judge Charles have now accepted Sharia in New Jersey. And of course, given the toxic environment we have in this country regarding anything Islamic, given the developments in uh, New York, this did not play out well. And of course, correctly so, the matter was taken on to appeal. And on appeal, the New Jersey appellate division uh, made sure that that verdict was corrected, that American courts will not at, in any way uh, be a party to people you know, practicing certain things in the guise of religion that violates criminal statute. And I must say, and uh, we can you know, also talk about another expert, um, that someone, a colleague of mine that yes. I know, who, who, who's much more well-versed in this issue, that the question of marital rape has, uh, has ethical dimensions. So even if Islamic law does not have anything to say about, you know, for or against, one doesn't need to take the default position because position that because a husband and wife had consented to marriage, that they do not need to renew their consent for sexual intimacy at every occasion. There's nothing in Islamic law that prevents the inclusion of such a consideration. And as I said earlier, that Islamic law or Sharia is very much open to new cultural and political contexts, and therefore it adapts accordingly. So um, I would like to hear from you know um, from people who are familiar with issues of this uh, of this kind what they think about it. Yes. So you mentioned uh, you've got a colleague, Professor Hina Azam, who works on this, and I want to bring her in, in in just a minute here. But to so to set the stage, I think there's a stereotype out there that Sharia law is unfriendly, unfair to women. And is there anything to that? Is that right? No, that, that is true. That uh, classical uh, Sharia law um, in, in the world that it was, was very much patriarchal. And when people just then duplicate that old interpretation into a context in which we, we look, we have gone through a major revolution in, 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 in the sexes. I mean, the post-enlightenment developments in which women and men are striving for equality, the equal status between the dignity of men and women. And this is a very different world in which we live in, in the world in which Sharia was fostered and when it was or originated in. Uh, but it doesn't mean that Muslims did not consider the dignity of women at all. Of course they considered. But it happens in different kind of social packages. And the point I always like to make and I like to share with audiences, and I tell my students that, mm -hmm. is that the problem that we have with those people who are using Islamic law and who are the interpreters of Islamic law today have really not up, not updated. I'm talking about more traditional authorities. There are a few enlightened authorities too, but the, the bulk of religious authorities in vast parts of the Muslim world are very much working what I would call on a DOS system. You know, the computer system old, of, computer. of, of mm -hmm. the old DOS system when you have a, a software that was operating on DOS. And you're trying to run that DOS system on, on Windows on Windows 7 or you know on a Mac, mm -hmm. is uh, most cases it does just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You need a whole new template to begin to understand uh, and and begin to interpret Sharia according to the fundamental values that we have in the societies in which we live. Otherwise, it becomes fairly anachronistic to bring in rules and regulations developed in the society of which very little trace remains in our societies, and therefore, in many cases. Radical reform is necessary, and radical rethinking is, necess uh, is necessary. So you will find, for instance, religious authorities like Sheikh Kardawi, who's based in Qatar, in, in, uh, in this capital of Qatar called Doha, that he, for instance, and a whole group of people have been suggesting uh, to Muslims living in, in the West, um, where there's a, there's, a, there's a provision in Islamic law that a Muslim woman, woman cannot be married to a non-Muslim man. That is the classical law. Mm -hmm. But what do you do when a, when a woman in, in America or in Europe converts to Islam and she has a perfectly good marriage and the husband has no 
qualms about her being a Muslim and they're quite happy. They think of their faith as being something that is private between two of them. Going to classical Islamic law, that marriage must end. Mm -hmm. But a number of jurists have re reviewed Islamic law in that matter and began to understand that no, that doesn't have to be in that way, uh, that the wife can remain on her religion, the husband can remain on his religion. That is quite radical. And Karadawi and his cohort of jurists who are based in Dublin, for instance, have come under furious attack uh, because of this uh, ruling. But I think they're getting, they're getting to that place uh, where Islamic law should be going. So it is a work in progress. And, and I think people should remember the, the analogy I gave of running a DOS system on a Windows-based uh, uh, computer. Professor Musa, we've got quite a number of questions that have come in, but I want to make sure to bring into the conversation here Professor Hina Azam. She is a Duke University Graduate School graduate and is now an assistant professor of Islamic studies at the University of Texas, Austin. She is in San Diego for a Middle Eastern Studies Conference. Uh, professor Azam, thank you for joining us by phone. Thanks for having me. So let me toss you the same question, which is this popular notion that uh, Sharia law is uh, unfair to women. Is, is that right? Well, I, I would definitely agree with um, Professor Musa that Islamic law developed, including you know um, its <clears throat> doctrines pertaining to women, gender relations, marriage, divorce, and so forth, so forth um, were all developed within a societal context that was highly patriarchal. And so... Um, most probably in the minds of the jurists who developed those doctrines, they weren't being unfair to women at all. Um, but yes, by our standards, and I really like the computer system analogy there, um, you know, many of the provisions of Islamic law, classical, traditional Islamic law, um, would feel unfair to us, you know, including observant Muslim men and women would find that they're you know, unfair to women. You, you both mentioned the issue of reform within Islamic law, and we have a question along those lines that comes from Reza in South Africa, and so let me uh, toss it out to both of you. <clears throat> it, it begins with a, a statement in Islam's encounter, uh, Reza writes, with modernity it is faced with a plethora of non-standard contexts onto which Sharia positions need to be established. In one response, uh, scholars like Rahman, for example, have advocated a movement away from the idea of mechanically superimposing the literalism of textual injunctions in favor of an approach which takes into account historicity and societal contextualization. The question is, to what extent would you advocate a modern-day revisiting of theology in order to better justify the approach to law which is described above? Professor Musa, let's start with you. No, I think that's a very important question. I think that's a question that uh, lots of scholars are wrestling with. And I would say that Reza is right in saying that what one has to go back to is to begin to theorize a new theology. In other words, how does one conceptualize the good? Right. Once you conceptualize the good and begin to understand that the good now and the people that who are going to be engaged in the good are men and women and young people, but also we're living in societies with non-Muslims um, and that non-Muslims are your neighbors. Once you have that kind, of, that kind of universe in front of you, you will then have to apply Islam's values and also you know, have new reflections on those values um, in which you will then be able to build, for instance, friendships with non-Muslims, whereas when you lived in a world in which you were segregated, religiously segregated, uh, you never met a non-Muslim or when you lived in imperial context, for instance, non, you, the Muslims were always one step higher than non-Muslims. And so that kind of relationships were never existed. So you had theologies that were bis based on certain kind of supremacist notions of Islam being above others. Once you begin to revisit those fundamental questions and you have that template, then you can begin to look at the kind of the best what I would call the best practices of, of, of the scriptural teachings or of the prophet's exam, examples or from Muslim history. And then you can build either strong lines or thin lines from those best moments in order to have a coherent tradition. But sometimes one will also have to admit that some of those practices have just died there from where they originated. So for instance, we no longer, longer have a world in which slavery is practiced. 
and there are tons of teachings in Islamic law as there would have been in the, in the Hebrew Bible regarding slaves. But those are no longer applicable. Uh, and, you know, you know, in a universe when you imagined women in a particular way, um, when that imagination, that social imaginary is no longer existent, then clearly about women or about men or about sexes, then those teachings no longer become applicable. They, in other words, they abrogate themselves over time. What does, I, I, uh, I would argue, what does appeal to a progressive reformist Muslim thinker is to think about what are the core values of Islam that Islam wish to preserve. So for instance, justice, it might have been perfectly just to have a hierarchical order at a particular time. But what would justice mean in a world, in our world, in which egalitarianism is a fundamental uh, credo? Uh, and respect and dignity of all beings, including the dignity of nature, the dignity of animals. So it creates a whole new uh, set of questions. And I think that there are Muslim jurists who are addressing those issues on a daily basis. And some of them are doing good things. But you also have these unfortunate um, events of an imam testifying in a New Jersey court, validating the husband's appeal to cultural uh, and religious uh, defense, which does not make sense according to any um, foundational value of Islamic law. Professor Azim, how would you address this question of reform uh, within Islamic law? Well, I think the questioner's point is, um, you know, very good, that really it's, it's almost impossible to, to re revise or re-envision Islamic law or ethics without um, going back to theology. I mean, this idea of the good, as Professor Musa raised, is critical. Um, I would add to that, you know, wh what do we think is the fundamental nature of the human subject, the individual subject, and what is the subject's relationship with God? Um, um, an example of where we can explore kind of how theology makes a difference is in questions of religious affiliation. Um, in classical Islamic law, um, there's a whole range of doctrines pertaining to conversion and apostasy and um, spreading of the faith through, um, through conquest and, and, and so forth that kind of assume that the, that the individual's religious affiliation is really, um, is really not as important as a kind of communal affiliation. And so um, if a person individually chooses to convert into Islam or out of Islam, then it's kind of read as um, either as a political act of, say, you know, apostasy has been kind of a betrayal of the community. Now, that relies on a certain theology. If we, if we were to rethink um, what religious affili affiliation means and see it as a kind of, um, not a black and white thing, but rather kind of a spectrum of stances that individuals may have um, and a kind of process by which they come to um, a sense of faith or truth um, or God, then it would be much harder to um, have very black and white lines about you know when a person is inside of the community or outside of the community, and certainly the idea of punishing somebody because they've come to kind of an honest reconsideration of what they believe in to be true wouldn't really make very much sense. Um, so I think the the question of theology is very much entwined with um, intertwined with that of. Uh, Sharia or ethics or moral law. We've got another question that's uh, come in from South Africa, so I want to get to that. Mm -hmm. And everyone watching is invited to participate in this office hours conversation on Islamic law with Professor Ibrahim Musa here at Duke University. So uh, we've got a question from Abdul Alim in Cape Town, and I guess he wants to put a limit on this uh, issue of reform. He asks, what, if anything, is immutable in Sharia law? Professor Musa. Yeah, that's, that's an um, important question, what is immutable. I think one can argue that the, the, um, the 
five, the rituals, for instance, in Sharia are in some ways immutable. In other words, that you have to fast, you have to pray, you have to do the pilgrimage, and you have to give your annual taxes and so the on. Pillars of Islam. Pillars of Islam. And, and, the, and the fact of those and the enforcement of those. But even there, for instance, circumstances change. Um, and Muslim jurors have applied a great deal of, uh, and uh, have applied their mind uh, to this issue, for instance. So, you know, there's a plethora of commentary of how you give your annual uh, religious taxes. Or, for instance, when there are too many people in the holy places doing the pilgrimage, and you have a particular order and a particular sequence in which you do your activities, but it's no longer possible that you can get every everybody to get three million people to do this particular ritual at just afternoon on a particular day, then you have to change the rules in order to accommodate the, the, the situation. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the immutability is, is clearly the question of, um, and, and, and that's been a kind of a great uh, concern for many people, um, that if Islamic law is going to become so mutable, then what is going to remain? Um, I think what, whatever, I think what is immutable are, is the fact that you're going to have values. And you can have values that are related to some, some being outside of yourself. And that's why people have religious affiliation instead of a secular affiliation. And what we call in philosophical terms that you believe in, in heteronomy, in other words, an authority that is outside yourself, in this case, God, and through a process of revelation and through prophecy, that makes you particular, therefore you're, you're a Muslim or you're a Christian or you're a Jew because of your kind of affiliation uh, through religious tradition. And, and that is the immutable part, that you have a link with the transcendent. I think people confuse the situation in thinking that practices and issues of day-to-day of, of -day engagement with the world must also have those kinds of transcendent and permanent and static requirements. So the only immutable would be God. And the only immutable, another immutable would be your relationship to prophecy. And another immutable would be your relationship to revelation. But the details of those will be reimagined in different times in different places. Therefore, Muslim theologies, for instance, have also altered over time given people's experiences. And so, um, and I would also add to what my colleague Dr. Azam has said about the question of, you know, say for instance, the question of choosing to leave Islam, which was at one stage considered to be a political act, an act of sedition, because it was seen as Islam was both your badge of, of religious affiliation and also your political affiliation. But in a world in which religion is no longer part of your public identity, but it's part of your private identity, in which we have citizenship, that question becomes irrelevant to the, to the extent that you're no longer engaging in any kind of uh, betrayal of the community, or you're not engaging in the rebellion against the political authority and you're not sowing dissent, but you are making a personal choice about transcendent, uh, transcendent questions. And so a lot of these rules and regulations have also been, were also once upon a time part of a political package. And these political packages and these political organizations and orders have undergone radical change. And so when we think about Islamic reform, we also need to think about changes in economic, political, and societal changes, and also changes in the social imaginaries. Of, of, of people and their understanding of who they are and what they are. And I think we need to, for instance, include that in, in the theology that we might want to, that Reza has asked about, would have to take science very seriously, uh, would have to take seriously um, the developments in our political orders, the way we organize our societies. Very good. And Professor Azam, what about um, <coughs> Abdul Alim's question here about immutability of Sharia law, and maybe specifically, is there anything immutable pertaining to gender? Ah, okay, so you added a good spin to it there. Um, and what is immutable pertaining to gender? <clears throat> you well, might pick, 
you, you might just pick up about uh, immut immutability, that question. Well, I mean, I think, I think that, I, would, I mean, I would agree with Professor Musa there that, you know, it's, um, it's uh, there's this kind of fundamental um, thing that we might call faith um, in terms of, you know, our sense of another. And then revelation is very important, too, because I think really, I mean, we have the rituals such as the prayer and the fasting, which um, bind the Muslim community together. Um, there's also the revelation, the text, the Quran. You know, there have been, you know, 14 centuries of interpretation that has taken the the verses of the Quran, the meanings of the Quran, in so many different directions. But there is this shared, um, nevertheless, you know, there is still this shared fundamental text. And I think that that is um, maybe considered part of the immutability of um, what it means to be Muslim or, or of, of Islam is that, you know, one person may say that, well, let's, you know, the, the ethical verses have greater weight or they should be the lens through which we read the concrete, uh, more concrete uh, laws. And others will say, no, 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 it's the, the concrete details that should guide our reading of the ethical verses. But we're still within the same universe. We're still taking the Quran and we're having these discussions um, about and within the, the the lens of the Quran, so I think that that's um, that that is part of the immutability of Islam. But if I could um, address this other question of gender, yes, um, you know, at this point in my life, um, I I I would say that there's actually very little that is immutable about. Um, and this is probably stepping on really dangerous territory, but very little that's really immutable about um, sexual relations or gender relations because um, of because of the fact that islam Islamic law, even even in its classical sense, does not prevent um, two people, a, a man and a woman, or you know a family structure from 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 kind of changing their own dynamics by agreement. Um, the marriage marriage is fundamentally a contract. It's a negotiated sort of agreement. And so, you know, if, uh, if classically the idea was that the husband was the breadwinner and the wife would stay at home and, you know, take care of the children, um, if the couple themselves want to change that dynamic, then there's nothing... I think that would really prevent that from being the case. And as a matter of fact, I mean, I would, I would, I would guess that actually a lot of Muslims who think of themselves as being, you know, very traditional, actually are not very traditional at all. Um, I, I love the example of, for example, uh, of of seeing women when I was overseas. Um, very pious women, you know, coming to Morocco or coming to Egypt to study Arabic um, or going to Zaytuna, for example, right now to study Arabic. I mean, according to, uh, you know, a pre-modern patriarchal system, those girls being unmarried would never be able to leave their homes and go 3,000 miles away to live in a dorm and hang out with a bunch of guys their own age to study anything. So already there's a kind of, um, you know, modernization or deconstruction of these very, you know, kind of traditional ideas. So, I mean, clearly, even among very traditional um, segments of the Muslim population, there are things that are quite mutable about gender relations. Professor Hina Azam is an assistant professor of Islamic studies at the University of Texas, Austin. She's also a graduate of the Duke Graduate School. Professor Azam, thank you for uh, participating in these office hours. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Azam. Professor Musa, we've got questions stacked up here, and I want mm -hmm. to uh, fire them at you. And okay. everyone who's watching can ask Professor Ibrahim Musa questions about Islamic law, Sharia law by Facebook, by Twitter, by email. So uh, here's a question uh, that's come from John. He's got a number of them, but the, the, they have a similar tone. The first one is, isn't it true that it is permissible in the Quran to lie and to deceive, quote, non-believers 
if it promotes and benefits Islam. Yeah, this is a, <clears throat> a kind of a statement that has become very prevalent. Um, and oftentimes people just, you know, follow some article or what someone had said. Um, what, what the Quran does say is that if your life is threatened mm -hmm. and you are required to defend yourself or you are faced with a serious situation that someone says, denounce your religion, others you get killed, or that you will face hardships if you have to declare your faith, then you might want to, then you are allowed the mitigating uh, possibility of, you know, denouncing your faith, but in your heart continue to believe. Or if you are, uh, you know, being fear persecution. So that is on the fear of persecution that you are given the option. But if you want to, if you choose to go the highway and, Take the, take the bullet, so to speak, then you're allowed to do so. But under no circumstances is any Muslim allowed to lie because lying is a major sin. And you cannot even lie to a non-Muslim. You cannot lie to a non-Muslim. You cannot lie to a Muslim. You cannot lie to... Otherwise, it makes nonsense, nonsense to this because otherwise we have no order. So whoever is propagating these kinds of ideas that Muslims are obliged religiously to lie in order to defend themselves are uh, basically completely, you know, distorting Islamic teachings and, and, and completely, you know, misreading materials that are there in the classical text. But those are about questions of survival in times of persecution, which is a common sense rule. In any common sense rule and any ethical system, that if someone puts a gun to your head and says, you know, denounce your loyalty to the Duke basketball team. I mean, you might want to choose, you know, which one is a greater value for you, but, you know, uh, I mean, you, you, and someone is serious and pulling the trigger, then, you know, you, you, you might have to make certain choices there. Next question. This one has been emailed in by Hashem, and he asks, given current controversies surrounding Islam, do you think a Friday prayer done publicly, parentheses outdoors, in campus, would be offensive to people, and why? Well, I think, you know, I, that's an interesting question about, you know, reading, uh, reading the temperature of an environment. And I, I, I would be, I would hate to speak globally. I mean, mm -hmm. in, and I think, you know, even the, you know, so if we're talking about the United States, I think that one could, you know, doing a prayer and a ritual publicly could be a way of make, make, making people see what Muslims are doing and that they are not engaging in terrorist activities and they are engaging in praying in something very benign. And people could even hear the sermon, provided the sermon is good. Uh, and I would hope that the sermon is very well thought out. Otherwise, it becomes even offensive to Muslims. So uh, that, that would be an important consideration. Or for some people who already have misgivings, some people might see a public prayer just to be kind of in your face again. You know. So I think one has to clearly assess the context and make wise judgments, I would say. Uh, that would be the kind of wise judgment that you would, you know, advocate for any kind of public event. That what kind of public event is going to be in your face, and what kind of public event is going to be something that uh, creates a greater um, communal harmony and creates, you know, a friendship and reaches out to people. Another question that's coming <clears throat> by uh, email along the same lines: a public perception of Sharia. A group of prominent U.S. national security experts produced a report saying Sharia poses a threat to the United States. You probably disagree with them, but why should the public believe you and not them? Because I'm an expert and they are not. Uh, but, but, and, and I, you know, the, the, the question is that those people who wrote that report, and that is the report that involves, a, I think, the uh, Center for Security Studies, I think, um, that's the right. Center for Security Policy, Center for Security uh, Policy, that report uh, makes a big deal of what they call creeping Sharia, and also um, is you know lashing out against um, the uh, Wall Street that has accommodated uh, Sharia compliant finance and a whole range of issues, and that is because um, the Center for Security Policy report assumes that you have to deal with Islam and Muslims in the same way you deal, dealt with Soviet communism. So they are still the last remaining Cold War warriors. 
And, and so they've mapped the entire strategy of combating Islam as a secular ideology, not as a religion. So that's your first point of miscommunication. So they can talk as much as they want to. No one is going to hear them who understand Islam as a religion. So I always tell my students, and if you want to have a serious conversation in a study of religion with any people, you need to understand what those people are all about. Now, if you want to willfully distort your opponent, then you are going to misread your opponent. And when you're going to misread your opponent, you're also going to create bad policies and rules and strategies for yourself. And in that case, you're just going to get your nose bloodied because you've misread your opponent. So for instance, I know that my opponent weighs 250 pounds. And I know my opponent is a very, you know, dexterous and ambidextrous individual, has a lot of talents. But I want to now imagine, no, that person only weighs 120 pounds. I don't think that person is very strong. I don't think this person has those skills. And then I'm going to engage in a battle with the person. I'm going to have myself very badly injured. And I think if you want to really see, now, sorry to use the kind of uh, confrontational example of a duel, but let's assume the people at the center for policy, uh, secu uh, policy security, uh, they are concerned about Islamic immigration in this country, the prevalence of the Sharia. What it requires is that you need to have very serious understanding of what Muslims themselves understand about Sharia. Because otherwise you are going to be engaging in a misreading of the situation. And unfortunately, some of the, I mean, some very important people are involved in this. Uh, James Woolsey, who was the former director of the CIA, is involved here. Uh, uh, General Jerry Boykin, of, uh, he became somewhat unpopular and because during the Bush era, for instance, he made statements saying that as a general, that his religion was much, much, much more superior to his Somali opponent's religion. And he made all kinds of statements that, that got a lot of media attention. And I'm not entirely sure that, that he would have the sense and, and objectivity of this. So I think this report is from its very foundation flawed because it's going to provide its readers a distorted understanding of what the reality is and what Sharia is. It's like telling Jews that, you know, halakha is something um, that they cannot practice and that halakha is, which is Jewish, uh, the equivalent of Sharia in Judaism, that halakha is, is, you know, should be something that people should not do so because uh, this is imposing certain kind of values. So are you, are you then going to tell people not to eat kosher food and not to have circumcision and not to do this and not to do that? That's exactly what you're try asking Muslims when you start portraying Sharia as an ideology or portraying it as something demonic. And so I think the why you should, why the reader, and uh, sorry, the, 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 the questioner should, should listen to what I say, but also many other experts, is that we know what we are talking about. If you're, we are going to engage in falsifying the facts, we are going to land up in a lot of trouble. And in our recent history, there's been a lot of doctored evidence provided to the American public and falsified material subject, uh, presented in the public. And we have faulted and erred much to our international standing and much to our credibility and with a great kind of cost to American blood and treasure. We've got another couple of questions. So Alan has followed back up on Facebook. He had a question at the start about the Sharia and the Constitution. Um, he asks, that is good to hear that you should be in favor of Oklahoma State question 755 since you believe Sharia has no design on becoming a dual legal system. Do you then condemn the lawsuit against the referendum in Oklahoma? I'm not into public advocacy. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what Alan should understand is that the rules in Oklahoma uh, that has been, or uh, state question 755, mm -hmm. that tries to exclude uh, consideration of contracts in terms of Sharia is not changing the constitution. The concern yeah. that people are saying that America's constitution is gonna be changed by Sharia rule that is not the case. The Constitution remains intact. What it talks about state law and also international law and also the cultural practice of American citizenry who are no longer only Jews, Christians, uh, 
and Buddhists, but also includes Muslims. And they would have a number of practices among themselves that they want to resolve according to Islamic law or they want to contract, or when we engage in international contracts with Muslim countries that will involve elements of Islamic law, you're basically putting, you're putting Oklahoma at a disadvantage. You also, and according to the, clue, uh, the clauses there, that Oklahoma can no longer entertain international, international law. That means that there's a design by Oklahoma legislators, and I would, if I were to be advising o Oklahoma legislators and say, Why, what do you have against Oklahoma? Why are you trying to make it into a backwater state? In other words, you're trying to exclude it from playing the international game. And this concern of bad Sharia practices ending up in Oklahoma or in New Jersey, you require sensible application of American law. Clearly, Judge uh, Joseph Charles had a what we would call a kind of a lapse of mind. And this is the case in the in, domestic in, dispute in, case in, in, New in, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And and we have review. And the appellate, uh, you know, the courts um, in New Jersey have overturned that. And any kind of bad laws that end up, and we have bad laws and judges making bad interpretations of laws on a daily basis, but on appeal, this gets overturned. Why treat Islam with any kind of exception? And, you know, uh, I think this is just a, a misplaced concern and fear, and there's no need to condemn the people who are raising the case against Oklahoma, it might be in Oklahoma's best interest that it does not engage in discrimination of its Muslim citizens. You've made some analogies <clears> with <throat> other faiths, and we've got a question that's come in along those lines. Mm -hmm. It's an email from Nicholas, and he says, as a Christian, I would think the U.S. would be in danger of Constantinianism, I guess reference to the Emperor Constantine, Constantine. if it doesn't <clears throat> include Sharia law. Would you agree? He follows up also at a base level couldn't one say that wherever justice is, there too is Sharia, thus any government that has been practicing justice has practiced Sharia. You know, that's such a, that's such a beautiful um, presentation and, and, uh, of the question, and I, and I like it, because one of the kind of, the earlier question that someone asked from South Africa about what is immutable, one of the things that classical, and I'll quote you, a 14th century Muslim jurist by the name of Ibn Qayyim al jawziya he wrote, and he's not the kind of your kind of uh, jurist of the canonical schools. He does belong to the canonical schools, but he's also very much a kind of a scripturalist jurist. He argues that wherever the indices of justice appear, wherever the indices of fairness and fairness appear, that is the moment for God's law, and that is the moment for Sharia. And therefore, why many Muslims find the United States Constitution attractive? because it has justice as, as it's one of its central backbones that is about justice and equality. And that squares, and if you translate that into Sharia terms, that is one of the fundamental building blocks of the Sharia is that of fairness and equality and justice. And so therefore, you know, there's in, in doing this last summer's controversy with the uh, promoter of the mosque uh, in downtown Manhattan, Imam Faisal Abdurov. Faisal Abdurov was many uh, years ago involved in what he called the Sharia Index, in which he tried to map the best values of the Sharia with the best values of the U.S. Constitution. And according to his reading, he said, these were things that Muslims can so easily buy into. In other words, if you're a serious Muslim, you can easily buy into American constitutional values because your own religion advocates similar kinds of values. So, and that was justice being a very important one. So clearly, um, for Muslims living in the United States, experiencing justice and living justice would be a, almost a translation of the essence of the Sharia. We're well into our office hour, <laughs> but uh, we do have one more question. I want to make sure we get it in. This is from Howard by email, and he says, do you feel that Republicans used Americans fear and ignorance toward Muslims and way of life to turn the midterm elections in their <coughs> favor. Also, what um, change, uh, also what came, it's a little bit uh, jumbled here, to change the way a lot of Americans view Muslims. So American perception <coughs> of Muslims and particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the midterms. Of course, American perceptions of, of Muslims in, in the United States was clearly very much damaged by the September 11 events and also the continuing events that are going on. And remember, we have soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan that are daily being killed or being maimed and injured, and their adversaries are Muslims. So when those soldiers come home, they cannot carry a very good impression of 
the culture that they've been exposed to and the religion because they were adversaries. And I think on a daily da daily basis, our our home, people in our in their homes and their living rooms are talking about Islam. So that has clearly damaged the, the reputation of Islam. I think it's not only uh, uh, Republicans, although Republicans were in the forefront of demonizing Islam and Muslims and some very senior people, but not all Republicans, and one should be fair, there were also fair-minded Republicans who were not engaging in that kind of activity. And, if, and one should be fair also that there were a number of Democrats that also caved into this kind of Islamophobia. What would be required is that people with good sense, and people of good sense speak out. We need to speak out in our churches, in our mosques, in our synagogues, in our media, and talk fair and talk sense. Otherwise, I fear <clears throat> that if we, do, if we are not going to talk sense, we are going to contaminate the pool and make it really toxic. And when that happens, of course, then, 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 then there is no clear way of negotiating and talking to each other. And what we really need in this country, and we need a, a, a around the world, is that people must be able to talk to each other with trust. Because once we create mistrust, even in an ordinary office hour context, if you and I don't trust each other, we cannot have a meaningful conversation. We can disagree, but there will still be trust. And the reason I will accept your disagreement or I'll accept the disagreement of any of my, our viewers would be because we have a fundamental trust that we accept each other with full integrity. Once we have suspicion, then I cannot believe what you have to, what, what you have to say. And therefore, we need to talk about facts and not about fiction. And a lot of the stuff that's going around in the blogosphere and elsewhere about Islam is tainted by fiction and tainted by fear and tainted by kinds of other kinds of motives that really does not foment productive conversation. And therefore, I was so glad to be part of this, uh, of this Office Hours uh, event to, to share uh, with a whole range of people uh, my views on Islamic law and Sharia. Professor Ibrahim Musa, thank you for uh, sharing your time and taking questions for this Office Hours. Professor Ibrahim Musa is an Associate Professor of Islamic Studies in Duke's Department of Religion. You can watch a recording of this session anytime on the Duke On Demand website. Watch Duke On Demand OnDemand.duke.edu this week in Duke On Demand, Duke freshmen have a dinner conversation with President Richard Broadhead about modern American prophets. We think of prophets as people who lived either a long time ago or who live very much on the margins of the known world. But what I was trying to do is to suggest that many familiar features of American life have been led by people who thought of themselves as prophets or were taken uh, as prophets by others. Also this week, a lesson in classical Indian dance at Duke's John Hope Franklin Center. A Duke medical student describes her project on pesticide exposure among Honduran farmers. And Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics supports refugees from Bhutan who are resettling in North Carolina. Ondemand.duke.edu Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.